Hello Internet, apologies for the hiatus between episodes. As everyone knows, the world is a bit of a crazy place right now due to the coronavirus. This has meant I've had to put creating videos on the back burner as it's not been practical to turn the living room into a studio. I've also had a few other projects that I've been working on which I hope to start filming soon for your viewing pleasure. Anyway, let's get started. In the previous video we looked at the G4 Mac Mini which was released back in 2005 and alongside with it was the first generation iPod Shuffle. This iPod was unlike any of the previous iPods we'd seen before and it was clear that Apple was going after the flash market in a big way. It relied on the autofill feature in iTunes which selected songs at random from a user's music library or from a specific playlist and copied over as many as would fit on the iPod Shuffle storage. Users could of course customise the content should they desire. Inside the box are the famous white iPod headphones which today look bulky and uncomfortable. Next we have the lanyard plug. Attaching this to your iPod Shuffle meant you could carry it around your neck. And according to a listing on Amazon, the iPod Shuffle lanyard provides the simplest, easiest way to carry your iPod Shuffle and the cap stylishly protects the iPod Shuffle connector. Both snap quickly and securely onto the end of your iPod Shuffle. While you could potentially look like a bit of a tool while wearing it, it did serve its purpose and I guess it would help while on a run or doing some other form of exercise. A first party waterproof case was also released by Apple, which was also worn in the same fashion as the lanyard. A few tugs on the cord confirms the connection is nice and tight, meaning your iPod shuffle should remain in place even while doing the most vigorous exercise. A downside to this cord is over time it tends to yellow. Moving on with the contents, we have here the instructions, the manual and warranty information, plus some Apple stickers, which have long since disappeared. A nice note across the box is a reminder, do not steal music. Firstly, we have the tiniest user guide, as there's really not much you need to know about how to operate this device. A CD with the software on that you should install prior to connecting your iPod, and contains not only the iPod Shuffle user guide, but the iPod Photo and the iPod Mini user guides as well. Also included was iTunes 4.7.1 and an iPod updater application which updated your iPod's firmware to the latest version. Next is the iPod Shuffle's user guide. This is much more detailed and goes over all of the functions of the iPod including how to configure it in iTunes and how to get music over to it. The instructions are clear and easy to follow. And finally we have the limited warranty information which makes for a fascinating read. Please excuse the troll fingernails. We are under lockdown and standards have somewhat slipped. On the front are simple controls for the volume, music play, pause, next and previous tracks. On the top is a 3.5mm headphone jack for the supplied headphones. Around the rear is a battery status button, which had I been bothered to read the instructions would be able to tell you what the flashing LED means. Above this is the slider which turns the iPod shuffle on and immediately puts the device into repeat all mode before selecting shuffle, which as the name implies shuffles through the songs in a random order, making it a delightful game guessing which song pairing the random order song selector has chosen. So that's pretty much it for your $99 or $149 depending on capacity. Apple offered a surprisingly comprehensive variety of uncommon add-ons for the entry level music player for an additional $29 each. An armband, a sports case, a dock connector and battery pack were some of the most notable offerings. As the iPod Shuffle was larger than your standard USB memory stick or connector, having a desktop dock was incredibly handy and meant you didn't have to go around the back of your Mac in order to plug it in and charge, or to transfer music over. The box is the same green as the iPod shipped in and along one side tells us which accessory we have here if the picture on the front wasn't enough of a clue. This is new old stock from eBay and costs more than I paid for the iPod itself, but there's something special about opening up new old stock, I digress. The dock has a decent weight to it and rubber covering the underside means it won't go scooting around your desk. The cable is generously long allowing for easy placement on either side of your monitor. Included is a cable tidy and a USB cover connector. As the Mac Mini I'm using only has two USB ports and they're both in use with the mouse and keyboard in one and the cinema display plugged into the other. I'm able to use the built-in USB hub at the back of the display and here's where the dock connector comes in extremely handy. The monitor is quite flush to the wall and without it would mean I would have to have the display at least 6 inches closer to me taking up valuable desk space. So now that the dock is plugged in let's connect the iPod shuffle. The design matches the iPod perfectly and looks very attractive. 
The flashing orange LED at the top lets us know that the iPod is now charging. Upon connecting the iPod, it immediately launches iTunes if it's not open already, or if it is, it shows in the folder pane on the left hand side. From here we can see the contents, or using the pop-up menu down at the bottom, we can auto-fill the iPod from a playlist. Pressing the settings button allows you to select options, such as the amount of disk space you'd like to use for data storage, but let's just fill it from our library using the auto-fill button. The iPod Shuffle uses a standard USB Type-A connector, unlike the 30-pin iPod connector on other models. This meant that it could be easily plugged into a machine without the need for a cable. However, the connector became fragile over time and could lead to the flex ribbon cable tearing off, rendering the iPod useless as you could no longer charge the device or copy music over. Transfer speeds using USB 2 were pretty quick, only taking a few minutes to fill. You could connect it to a machine that only had USB 1, but transfer speeds would be much lower, and of course you could still charge. An option in iTunes allows the re-encoding of high bitrate audio tracks to Apple's AAC codec at 128 kilobits per second, which meant you could have lower file sizes of audio tracks, meaning more audio could be synchronised over. Another preference in iTunes was the ability to enable USB disk mode. This turns your iPod Shuffle into a USB memory stick, allowing for the storage of non-audio related documents and files. A slider allows you to specify how much storage you wish to assign over, and it reminds me of doing so in Windows CE. Once you have ticked this option, on a Mac, the iPod shows up in the Finder as a volume and you can open it like you can with any other storage medium. Copying files to and from the device is fast and comparable to USB memory sticks, as after all this is flash storage. Here we can see the iPod Shuffle on the desktop with its custom icon. Copying over a few hundred K JPEG happens so quickly that there isn't time for a progress bar to appear. Open it with Quick Look and it's just as if you are opening the file off your local hard disk. Of course using your iPod as a USB flash drive means you have to sacrifice some storage for music, but it was a nice feature to include. As the dock had a standard USB Type-A connector on, and Apple thankfully decided not to ship the iPod Shuffle with a non-standard USB connector, like they did on some keyboards, you could use the dock to plug in other USB devices. Here is a verbatim USB memory stick, and we can see it quite happily connects to the dock. This means USB 2 transfer speeds were achievable, rather than using the USB 1.1 connectors on the keyboard. All in all, for its price, it wasn't a bad iPod, but not having a screen let it down somewhat. The only way to find your favourite song was to play, then listen, and then skip forward until you found it. But paired with iTunes, the competition couldn't match it in terms of its ease of use or price to capacity ratio. The iPod Shuffle's lifespan lasted 12 years or so, so it must have been doing something right. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're staying safe and hope to see you in the next one.